Hi everyone and welcome to the Spring 2015 Fundamentals. My name is Albert, this is Leo. Hello. We're going to be your instructors for today. Uh, I'm actually replacing Vlad, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but he's definitely going to be with you guys next week. And today we have a very, very, very special lesson prepared. That's true. In fact, it's one of my favorites because it really gives the, um, uh, the, f the, the foundation of, uh, of what is the, the method of, uh, that, uh, that's um, within the wisdom of Kabbalah. And how is that method different from other methods? We're really going to talk at the most foundational level of uh, how do we apply this wisdom. So before we begin, I also want to say that uh, this is a special lesson because uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, while there's a lot of students who are watching individually from, you know, from their computers at home, there's a group of students uh, who have gathered together in Toronto uh, where we have uh, one of our groups and study centers. And they are with us, and they're watching live, and they're going to be asking some questions live. And uh, you'll see as we go through the lesson, uh, what's the importance of gathering, study, studying together, really? Uh, like, what's, what's, what's in this thing, in this action, that is uh, relevant to, to the wisdom? So we'll, we'll see um, how, how it relates. And we have a lot of friends with us today. Um, uh, I can, I mean, we don't have time to read, obviously, all the names but, uh, you know, just some, some yeah, people. No. Yeah, we have Michelle from New York, Larissa from, and Larissa from New York, Tina from California, had some great questions last week, uh, Phil from Texas, uh, Ken from Austin, we have uh, Rhonda from North Carolina, we have uh, Stardust, beautiful name, from Florida. Uh, we have quite a few people from North Carolina, actually. Uh, Guillermo from Colombia, I uh, imagine that's the country, and Gloria from Mexico, and... Uh, uh, even uh, Jose from all the way from New Jersey. And I would like to remind everyone that we're going to try to make this class as interactive as possible. And on your end, that means sending as many questions as you have. Just bombard us with questions. The more, the better. Uh, the friends that are in Toronto, I believe, are going to be able to ask live. Yes. And uh, of course, any questions that we will not be able to answer here. We'll get answered in the forum, hopefully. If not, you know, hit us again uh, next time. Don't give up. Definitely collect the questions. It's always interesting to see, um, you know, the kind of questions that we have and how they get answered. And, of course, uh, as usual, we'll be reading from this book, Kabbalah for the Student, a great book to have. And if you don't have it, you can also download the PDF from our website. So what are we talking about today? Today, well, it's really a continuation of... Uh, what was it today? So Wednesday, so Sunday. <coughs> a continuation from Sunday's class where we discuss the, the law of root and branch. And we learned that the Kabbalistic texts, and the Kabbalists in particular, they use a certain uh, language. They, they use a language that's based on the root and branch connection. Okay? So we're just going to take a few minutes right now to review what we talked about on Sunday. And we're going to see where exactly, how exactly that affects the approach to studying the wisdom of Kabbalah. Maybe you could tell us in just a few words. Well, in just a few words, it's actually very simple. Uh, and we're lucky to live in a time as today because we have all these great examples around us. I mean, you can imagine just a hundred years ago, a lot of, even to approach this, the study of the wisdom would have been so difficult, so disconnected from uh, everyday life of people in the you know, early 20th century, 19th century, not to mention hundreds of, of years ago. Uh, so today, uh, why, why am I saying it's, uh, we're, we're very lucky? Because um, we can take a great example from uh, computer programming, where uh, just like in the root and branch, where the Kabbalists use uh, a language made of everyday items that we can identify and see around us in this world, but they use that in order to describe very precisely phenomena, forces in the spiritual world. However, as we know, you need to have a key to it. You need to have a guide. You need to have some, someone to explain it, to kind of guide you through it, because just, just understanding the face value of those words is not going to do it. So if you're familiar with computer programming, it's a little bit the same thing. You can kind of read through the, the HTML, uh, HTML code, uh, and you'll recognize a lot of familiar words, but they will mean nothing. They will, they will not let you understand that the, you know, the end result of that is actually this, you know, this image or this, right, this quality on the screen, right? So there's a, there's a, like a program and there's like the result of the program. And Kabbalists use this um, in a very unique way uh, because it, they allow 
each other to communicate very easily, right? So a Kabbalist in attainment, as we said, can com- convey to other Kabbalists in attainment uh, of the things he has attained. So that's a great quality of the language of, uh, of roots and branches. And what we learned last week is that in order to understand the branches in, in this world and everything that's happening, we have to really attain the roots. So that's kind of a the key, really, to, to the wisdom, right? It's not really um, intellectual wisdom. So, in, in other words, the Kabbalists, they, they give us uh, all these different words, and unless we have this key that, that Leo was talking about, unless we have this key, we don't really know what these words are referring to. So, they could be using everyday language, just like, you know, we see book and tree and, uh, and pen and, and different things of, of this nature. But we don't really know what these things are referring to. It's a really good example with the, with the whole HTML uh, thing. I, 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 yeah, I like the example of, um, of, of a blind person. And you're trying to explain something to a blind person. And if the blind person has never experienced something, something as simple, let's say, as, as colors. Uh, let's say you're trying to explain the color red. Or sunset. Or sunset. Used in the last lesson. Yeah. yeah. So how can you possibly explain something to someone who's never grasped it? You can use the same exact words that the person is familiar with. In fact, you could describe it in terms of numbers, right? Like a hexadecimal thing. Yeah. You could try to describe it in the wave form. But in reality, until a person has actually experienced yeah. it, if a person doesn't have that sight to experience it, he really will never understand what this is talking about. So this is, this is the problem with, the, with Kabbalistic texts, uh, that in order to understand it, a person needs to already be in spiritual attainment. The person needs to be already have a have a certain feel, have a certain sense that is able to understand and feel and and grasp what the Kabbalists are talking about. And uh, Baal Sulam writes about it in in our uh, essence of the wisdom of Kabbalah that we studied uh, extensively also last week. I mean uh, on Sunday, he writes this on, on page 27 from the article, the essence of the wisdom of Kabbalah. He writes. This language of the branches, though extremely suitable for its task of delving into the studies of this wisdom, more than other languages, it is only so if the listener is wise in his own right, meaning that he knows and understands the way the branches relate to their roots. It is because these relations are not at all clear when looking from the lower upwards. In other words, it is impossible to find any deduction or semblance in the upper roots by observing the lower branches. As we said, you, you need a guide, you need someone, and, and that's why we're lucky that we have actually a lineage of Kabbalists that, you know, that we, can, we can follow in their footsteps. Without it, we would have been stuck here like animals, <laughs> probably. So, so this is, the, this is the, the general problem, right? We have, this, uh, we have all these Kabbalistic texts. We, we know they're based on the on this law of uh, root and branch. But we also know that unless we're in attainment, unless we're in the degree of a Kabbalist, that we can't really understand these texts. We, they, they don't really tell us anything. And in fact, for thousands and thousands of years, people have been using the same texts that Kabbalists use, but because they're not in attainment, they, they, they get a different picture from these texts. And a lot of times we could point to the Bible, the, the Torah, all these different books. And we see that even though they're written from the same language of uh, roots and branches. If a person doesn't understand it, what does he see? He sees this world. He sees that he's talking about this world, that I need to follow certain uh, rituals, I need to do X, Y, Z, and etc. He doesn't see that this is actually referring to the spiritual world. It's actually referring to the connections that are found in a higher degree of reality. So this is the, the basic problem that we're going to try to address today. That uh, how do we deal with it? How do we work with this? What is the method that what is the method that wisdom of Kabbalah is offering? If there is such a problem, and, and even more importantly, or as importantly, uh, how do we use this language that we can understand to attain something that we have no connection to? <laughs> it's a, it's really a uh, you know it's a, it's an interesting puzzle if you think about it. And uh, actually, um, it is not a uh, hopeless game. Uh, we were given something that we can use to attain spirituality. And that thing, that condition, that only, the only thing really that a person needs to attain spirituality is the desire to attain spirituality. You must have heard it before, and you'll hear it many times, because that's the only thing that was created, a desire. So that's our starting point. That's the foundation. 
to want to reach spirituality. And we've talked in the past lessons about the evolution of desire, how it, uh, it developed in humanity from the very basic desires that we share with the, with the animate degree through the more complex desires that uh, are really presented in the context of the society and the social interactions and all the way to the finer desires that kind of seek to know and to know what's happening and, and why and what for and to what end. Uh, so as that desire develops, we come closer and closer to the spiritual path, really. So, so desire is uh, more important than intellectual understanding. In fact, Kabbalists tell us, and we'll, we'll see uh, momentarily, that intellectual understanding, in fact, can only stand in the way of attainment. So this is a very important, I think, point because I think a lot of us, when I come to this lesson, you know, we have our books and our notebooks, and we really want to be very good students and, you know, and take notes and write everything and try to memorize and learn new concepts. And this is all good, right? I mean, you, you need it, right? It's, it's, uh, it's really just like, uh, like driving, right? You need to take a theory, write a theory test, understand the size. You need to have a basic understanding of how the engine works, right? How the car works, how the traffic rules how, how this works right but when you're actually driving the car when you finally get you you know to sit in the driver's seat and, and actually get into it right intellect is not going to do you any good right you have to have to have a feeling of what's happening and you have to and we know that how in the beginning right when you drive uh, those of you who have a driver license the first time you're in the car you have to kind of think about everything you know i learned to drive sticks so it was like i do this and i press that and it's a you know that intell you can drive with this intellectual process. The car is going to be doing this jerking movement. Mm -hmm. So it's only when you actually begin to feel it and driving becomes the second nature to you that you can you can get into it. So in a similar way, but slightly different, um, that's how we approach the study of Kabbalah. Meaning <clears throat> there are things that we need to understand. I mean that's why you, you are going through this fundamentals course. There are concepts, and it's okay to understand those concepts and to you know, take notes and to have a basic understanding of the system. But the attainment doesn't happen from this intellectual understanding. It happens through the desire. And we're going to go into a lot more details about this in the sec second portion of today. Uh, but right now it's worth mentioning that uh, if we cannot use our intellect, right? We say it's only the desire. Um, <coughs> what do we do? Right, so we, we know usually we're intellectually driven. We, like you said, we, we sit down, we take notes, we, we follow something, uh, but we can't use our own intellect, right? It's, it's something so almost, I don't know, it's uh, in opposition to what we're accustomed to. How can it be possible? It was against reason. Yeah, against reason, exactly. How can it, poss how can it be possible that uh, we cannot use our own reason to sort of grasp this goal? Well, let's remember for a second from the last lesson why we cannot use it. Because... Our intellect is the intellect that was developed from as a result of our egoistic desire. So it's the intellect of this world. So it's really useless to try to understand the upper world with the same, with the same intellect. Because it's going to immediately convert everything to the egoistic terms. And it's not a process that you can intellectualize about. Meaning we do this automatically. So the, um, the, the study of Kabbalah is really um, a study that we, we need something, we need some force, we need some means by which to kind of right exit from that condition. How do, we do, how, how, how do we do this? And th there's a few things. One of the most basic things is that instead of using our own intellect, we, tr we try to use the intellect of whatever is found on this higher degree. And we know that the Kabbalists are the ones that are found on this higher degree. So typically, what we would need to do is we would either need to follow the, the advice of a teacher, of an authentic Kabbalistic teacher who's found in this higher de degree, or we would need to somehow connect to their books in a, in a different way, which, which we're going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. But uh, right now, let's focus a little bit on, on this uh, advice of the Kabbalists and why this is important. As, as uh, Leo said, uh, we're on this current degree of existence. And on this higher degree, we don't have any perception. We don't have any intellect. Uh, it's completely opposite to what we're used to. Uh, so much so that the Kabbalists tell us every single degree of spirituality is almost a, a world of its own. 
that uh, from one degree to the, to the next are such different rules, such a different perception that uh, you, can't, you can't even skip from one degree to the other. It's just completely different. You can't imagine it, even if you wanted to. Right. I, it's, there's actually a great, I, I heard a, a great story, which we don't have time to share, unfortunately. <laughs> However, <laughs> no, but the, the underlying thing about the story was try to imagine if you were had, you know, if you were conscious as a baby in its womb. And try to imagine your life in the womb compared to the life you're going to be born into. I mean, it's, it's upside down, right? I mean, you get food from your belly button. You know, none of your muscles, you know, really are able to hold you. Your skeleton is, is, is soft. Uh, you, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't make, uh, uh, you know, you can't speak because you're, uh, and you can't breathe because your lungs are full of water. I mean, if you had to try to guess the kind of life a baby, you know, is going to live based on this condition in the womb, it would have been nothing like this. I would imagine a world in underwater where we all get fed through our belly buttons, you know, and we uh, and we're somehow connected to, to, you know, through a pipe to something. It's it's really unimaginable, and that's kind of the analogy to between our state here in this world and the upper world, the world of causes, right? <coughs> and uh, Baal Salam, do you want to read it? Or I'll read it. Baal Salam writes in page 28, uh, continuing in the same article. Uh, he, he tells us, the lower is studied from the higher. Thus, one must first attain the upper roots, the way they are in spirituality, above any imagination, but with pure attainment. And once he has thoroughly attained the upper roots with his own mind, <coughs> he may examine the tangible branches in this world and know how each branch relates to its root in the upper world in all its orders in quantity and in quality. So basically, if you want to, if you're a baby in the womb and you want to study about this world, don't ask another baby. Ask someone who's already, you know, came out to this world. Which is why we need to rely on those that are already found in this higher degree. So we need to follow the advice of the Kabbalists. And the Kabbalists give us clear advice. And once we begin to actualize it, uh, regardless of whether we understand it or don't understand it, we begin to slowly change, we begin to slowly develop until we become more in tune, uh, more in balance with this higher degree. And how exactly this works, we'll learn in a few minutes. We just wanted to really point out the importance of following the, the Kabbalist. It's, uh, it's very similar to the example that we gave earlier with a blind person. If a person is blind and, and uh, there's a person who has sight, uh, naturally, what needs to happen is that the person who's blind needs to follow the person who has sight. Otherwise, the, the, the blind person will trip and fall along the entire path. So we need to use what we what we have. And we're very lucky that we have uh, access to, to a Kabbalist in our, in our generation that is able to lead us and guide us on this path towards spiritual attainment. Um, I, there's a few interesting questions here. I, I, I don't know if we'll able to get to all of them, but uh, let's see. Annie is asking, if, if there is a root for every branch in the next higher world, does that account for my sense of my own higher self? Does it apply to people, not just objects? So does it apply to people, not just objects? Of course, there's a root for, for everything. It's uh, people, objects, uh, you name it, there, there, there's a root for it. Um, we don't quite know where our root is uh, until, we, until we reach spiritual attainment. The Kabbalists do tell us that every single person has his own uh, root, and this has to do with a person's role in the world, uh, with, uh, with his role in this uh, connection of, uh, I don't know if we've already explained the, the, the soul of the Dhamma A little bit, yes. A little bit, okay. So <coughs> we know that we're all connected in, in, the higher, in this higher state that the Kabbalists describe us. We're already all interconnected. And from that interconnection, we know that uh, different people can have a different rule of their soul, as, as the Kabbalists put it. So they can have a slightly different role towards, towards everyone else. Uh, we don't quite know what each person's specific role is until we have this spiritual attainment. But yes, every single thing has its own, its own root. Um, there's also another good um, uh, question. Uh, how can we identify a real Kabbalist versus one that is not, if we can trust him? Or in, if we cannot trust our own intellect? This is a beautiful question. It's a beautiful really question, Really good right? question. If I'm not mistaken, 
I believe one of the later lessons actually talks about this exact thing in a lot more details. So maybe Leo, you just want to give us. I can say. I can say. Well, in a nutshell, I can say one thing, and I, I will tie this with your permission with a question from Tina. So this question was. Uh, I'm sorry, just because it's jumping. Um, th this question was from uh, Edgar, by the way, from Dallas, and I want to tie it with a question from Tina, who's asking. Um, uh, if uh, you know, those of us who have been studying other metaphysical studies, are they integrated to Kabbalah? Should we set those teachings aside for now? But actually, you'll see it's, it's all actually one thing. The thing is, the Kabbalists tell us is very simple. A person studies where his heart desires. So, in a way, no one, no one will be able to tell you if this is the right place for you to study. Because, very simply, until we can reach attainment, right? We cannot say, we cannot talk with certainty about this current state. So all we have to do is we have to try to really listen into that inner voice of ours, that that point in the heart that kind of pulled us towards these studies in the first place, and really try to to feel it, right? To see, uh, to see, you know, how it kind of how it feels in this environment, and with you know, with these studies, with these ideas. And if a person is uncertain, he should absolutely uh, try other methods, other approaches. It's okay. It's quite all right. However, what, what I will say is that in spirituality, probably like in many other areas in life, you want to go all the way. Meaning, it's not this kind of, uh, you know, I have, we have a feeling that uh, spirituality is like this big buffet where I can go and I can kind of take a little bit of eggs and some this and some that, and I have my plate and I go back and I come back, I fill it again. Spirituality is not that. Spirituality is more like a door that you open and then it opens another door and another door and another door. You cannot be opening multiple doors at the same time. You really want to focus and really follow the advice of Kabbalists all the way through to see for yourself if they work. If you keep combining it, mixing it with other systems uh, and we're not in attainment yet, it's only going to create a lot of confusion. So, again, we'll touch it in a later lesson. My recommendation is if you try something, you know, kind of check with yourself. Is this the place? Does it feel right? And if it feels right, give it a chance. Like go all the way with the, with the advice. Clean the table. You know, start with a clean slate because everything we know is, is surely a result of some confusion or another, which is a result of the language of branches and roots. So it's all, <laughs> you know, beautifully connected. It's all one big nice mess. It's all big <laughs> nice mess. It's true. Do you have, by the way, do you have a question from Toronto uh, before they, we go they to said, the... They said not yet. Said not yet. Okay. Um, do you want to take another question or move? May, I, I suggest we move to the next part because uh, at uh, quarter two we say goodbye to Toronto. So um, maybe we should uh, continue if, if no one has another uh, another question specifically on, on that. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's okay. go on. If there's more questions, we can take them later. Okay. So we just... Um, we just presented the, the basic issue that we're dealing with when studying the wisdom of Kabbalah, meaning there are all of these great texts of the Kabbalists, and they've really been open to the public thousands of years. Uh, the problem is that unless a person is in attainment, what happens? He really has no clue what these books are saying. Uh, he can read them, and he'll, he'll just become more and more confused because he, he doesn't know where exactly they're, they're pointing to. He thinks it's talking about this world. But we know it's only talking about the spiritual world. So, with that in mind, why do we even need to study the texts of the Kabbalists? If uh, we, we don't have the spiritual attainment and we can't properly understand them, why should we b bother at all with these texts? Maybe it's enough, well, like we said, uh, just to follow uh, the advice of a teacher. Uh, what is, the role, what is the, the role of these Kabbalistic texts in our, in our, in our studies? So, we're going we're gonna to grasp, we're, I'm sorry, we're going to answer this question right now. Well, so maybe I think we should read something from, uh, this is from uh, page 373 in Kabbalah for the Student, uh, and it's the article, uh, it's the introduction to the study of the Tenth Sefirot. It's a very comprehensive article. We study it repeatedly over and over uh, because it has a lot of depth. Um, uh, in this case, this is item 155, and this is the article that Baal Sulam wrote uh, as an introduction to the six-volume study of the Tense he wrote, which is an interpretation, an interpretation more like a commentary, an explanation on the Ari's Etzchayim, Tree of Life. So, uh, 
in, let's just basically listen to Baal Salam instead of. Just, and keep in mind that this is one of the most fundamental uh, pieces, parts of this article, and you're going to hear it uh, referenced again and again in our studies and later studies as well. Uh, so this is really very fundamental to everything that we do in the wisdom of Kabbalah. So let's see. So he says, Therefore, we must ask, why then did Kabbalists obligate each person to study the wisdom of Kabbalah? Indeed, there is a great thing in it, worthy of being publicized. There is a wonderful, invaluable remedy to those who engage in the wisdom of Kabbalah. Although they do not understand what they are learning, through the yearning and the great desire to understand what they are learning, they awaken upon themselves the light that surround their souls. Beautiful. Let's read it again. Yeah, let's read it again. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. Every time you read it again, it, it opens up another, uh, another layer. Therefore, we must ask, why then did the Kabbalists obligate each person to study the wisdom of Kabbalah? Indeed, there is a great thing in it, worthy of being publicized. There is a wonderful, invaluable remedy to those who engage in the wisdom of Kabbalah. Although they do not understand what they are learning, through the yearning and the great desire to understand what they are learning, they awaken upon themselves the lights that surround their souls. Okay. So it's very interesting because he, he brings up a few things here. He brings up that there's a certain remedy found in these uh, authentic Kabbalistic texts and that this remedy is based upon really even without understanding but just wanting to understand by, by yearning to, to really delve into the depth of, of these texts to see what's really, what really stands behind it. There's a certain remedy that works upon us and what does it do? It slowly, slowly, slowly um, makes us more compatible with this upper world, more compatible with exactly what the texts are talking about. It makes us similar to, to the root that they're, that they're pointing to. So Lee is drawing us a beautiful picture over here. So, beautiful, yes? Okay, so what are we talking about? Basically, this very interesting, very interesting mechanism. So we have... We have the heart, right? We have the heart. We have our, our, uh, the heart is the seat of our desires, basically. And the way the wisdom of Kabbalah is built is that they're saying, okay, we can use this thing. We can use that desire, which normally is used selfishly, right, just to um, point us in sources of pleasure in this world. We can use that desire if it's aimed at spirituality, even if we don't know exactly what spirituality is and you know, what we're we trying to attain, but just the mere kind of pointing of that desire in that direction, what it does is it starts to attract this thing called surrounding light. This surrounding light is working on me even as I'm even as I'm reading the text, as I'm getting to immerse myself with the material that Kabbalists who have attained the next degree, the spiritual degree they are talking about, they are writing to us from that degree. So when I read those words, it's not that the words, and this is a very important concept to understand, it's not that the words or, or, or the, the book itself is holy, rather it's my desire to be in the place from where they wrote those words. That desire, those words help me awaken that desire, and that desire in turn attracts that thing called the light, because we know the only thing that exists is a desire, right? A vessel, a deficiency, and the light. So the light is in constant dance with our deficiencies. Always. It, it happens constantly, automatically. But here we have a chance. Using the words that Kabbalists left for us, we have a chance to really attract a particular kind of influence, right? From the light that will then do something to us. What will it do? It will slowly correct us, slowly make us compatible, slowly adapt us to this higher system. And it's really interesting the way, the way this, this whole thing works because it's not something that um, we have like a, almost like a direct cause and effect relationship here. And here in the, in the text, Baal Salam calls it a remedy. And typically when we think of a remedy, we think of, um, I don't know, all sorts of things you hear from your grandparents or from society or from the you know, things passed down from generation to generation that science can't quite, can't quite prove 
that there's something there. There's something there that uh, even if you don't quite see a connection, but uh, if you take a certain medicine or if you, if, you, if you mix it a certain way and you drink it down, even though science says no way it's going to happen, still there's some kind of connection there that does take place. And here it's something similar that we don't quite have this cause and effect relationship here. But we know that when we study, when we try to attune ourselves in a certain way, like uh, Leo said, we, we try to aspire to be in this higher degree. We, we try to really yearn for it. Uh, we draw upon ourselves a certain influence. And this influence slowly, slowly changes us, even though we may not feel it at first. But it slowly changes us and adapts us to this higher system. And it works very similar to the way remedies work in our, in our world that we don't quite have this cause and effect relationship, but there's something there. And the Kabbalists are telling us there's something there. In fact, uh, another very good way to look at it is, is if you take any person who did not grow up in Western culture, uh, there's still a, you know, a good number of people like that on the planet, even today. And you take uh, such a person from one of the tribes in the jungle, for example, bring him put him in front of a Walmart and tell him to walk towards the door. He will take a few steps towards the doors and what will happen? The automatic doors are going to slide open. And at that moment, this person is going to freak out. <laughs> Why? Because he doesn't see cause and effect. We know what's happening. There's a sensor and motion and all the rest of it and the doors open. But for someone who's, who's seeing it for the first time, the effect is so startling. Uh, even I remember myself as a kid when I was in, you know, in, in the room and the light would turn on and off, and I was so intrigued by how, you know, how is it happening, how the light gets turned on and off and, until I figured out there's a switch. But even then, I didn't see the connection between the switch and the light. And you, know, you have to learn what's happening in the walls and the wires. It's really the same thing. The fact that we don't see it doesn't mean that it's not happening. It's, it's happening. It's very much so. But we just see the effect of it. So that, that's really what when Kabbalists talk about sigula, remedy, it's that quality, right? Um, there's also, I mean, we mentioned in lesson uh, number three, if I recall, we talked about the cogwheels inside a watch, right? That the little cogwheel, you know, is going like crazy. The second hand, right, the second, the cogwheel that, you know, uh, connects to the second hand is going like crazy. It spins, uh, you know, thousands of times in an hour, but it takes the hour, right? It, it takes it, it has to go so many times without... No, with, with any, you know, no seeming change, right? Until it hits the right measure, the right amount of spins, and that big cogwheel, you know, does this, and the thing does that, and everything, right? So, so suddenly a whole new phase is, is, is opened up. It's really the same thing. I mean, there are a lot of processes in nature that we simply do not see the direct cause and effect but they are very well connected and scientists are learning about them you know, more and more today. So the, the question is, why don't we see this cause and effect relationship? Why is it built in such a way that the way that these books work, that the way the, that these authentic Kabbalistic texts work on us, is that we don't have this direct cause and effect relationship? So let's take for a second and um, uh, think about the, the, the opposite state, that we would have this cause and effect relationship. Meaning we would know exactly that, okay, we want spirituality, we just need to press this button, and there it is, there is spirituality. What is going to happen? Naturally, we're going to run after the spirituality, in what way? Egoistically. Just like we run after everything else egoistically, just like we're able to measure and discern, okay, what's better, this state, that state. And we're able to, to work with our will to receive and, and, and see what's better for us and make an action there. But here, precisely because we don't have this direct cause and effect relationship, precisely in such a manner, we're able to really aspire for, for spirituality, regardless of how our desire to receive sees it. And this is something very special, because as we learned, spirituality is something that's opposite to our um, desire to receive. It's something that's, that, that functions on this program of the soul. So that's why from our degree, we don't see how this cause and effect relationship works. And it's built like that for a purpose, so we wouldn't aspire to, to reach spirituality egoistically. But once we r rise to a higher degree, of course we'll understand, just like the, we know how the light switch works or how the automatic doors work, uh, we'll understand how all of this works. From our current degree, it's still like a remedy. From a higher degree, we'll understand exactly how it's working.
Uh, I also want to give another great example, which uh, any of you, uh, you know, if you have kids, uh, unfortunately, we don't remember ourselves as kids, but um, not initially or not most of us. But if you have kids and you look at kids, um, you see something very interesting. A child doesn't think of growing up, right? What he does, he plays, he constantly plays in the next state that he's trying to attain, right? So you have a little kid, he's playing with a little toy car, right? He's playing with a toy car, he's making the noises, the sounds. To him, this is the car experience. Then maybe a few years go by, now he actually has a, a bigger plastic car he can sit in, a wooden car, whatever. He can actually simulate all of that. To him, it is as real an experience as driving a real car. He doesn't have the distinction. Rather, he constantly yearns for a more, uh, you know, a more complex experience, a more fulfilling experience. You know, the next kind of degree in his development, where he have better control, you know, m you know, control of his faculties, motor control, uh, you know, his senses, his spatial uh, sense of, per you know, perception, all those things. But the, the child doesn't sit down in the morning and say, well, today I'm going to work on my sp spatial perception and my, right? kids don't do it. R rather, they play. And that act of playing, that desire to be in that state, does the same thing as the surrounding light does to us with respect to spirituality. That desire invites, it draws the same forces of nature that then work on the child's body, you know, activate all sorts of processes. You know, the environment sends all those cues, you know, the, the genes start to work, etc., etc., etc. And the result is the child grows. But it doesn't grow because he has a direct cause and effect. Rather, it's the action, the playing, that desire, the, you know, the nurturing of that desire that you know, gets him to grow up. So, so think about it. It's a very interesting, very interesting thing. I wonder if we have questions from Toronto. Uh, um, they're saying no, they, they don't have any. But if you guys do, let us know, and we would love to hear it. I want to, to add that we, we talked a little bit about uh, playing this higher state, about wanting to be in this higher state. And as we learned, this higher state is a state of connection. It's a state where uh, all of these different pieces that we see that are separated, they become connected and they're, um, they're connected in uh, <coughs> short. So we know that with this in mind, it's uh, much more preferable to play this higher state of being already connected in an environment of other individuals who are also studying this wisdom, meaning in a, in a group type of environment. Um, when we're already becoming similar to the higher degree in such a way, it really makes it easier to draw this light that, that corrects us and makes us more similar and in tune with this higher state. And uh, we have a, actually a, a, a question from uh, Jose from New Jersey. He's saying, well, it's so difficult to break all habits and behaviors, and they are so ineffective, all those, uh, all those things. So what is an applicable step? step in breaking these old habits, relying on the power of Kabbalah. So, Jose, the, the way to, to do anything, the way to really grow our desire for the effect of the light is by connecting with others. This is, a, um, again, another genius concept uh, you know, built into the system. You know, each of us were given just a little tiny bit, right, uh, you know, a small desire, just enough, that's just enough to bring us here. But from here on, it is our task to develop consciously, right? So in a way, we find ourselves like this child trying to grow up, but instead, but instead of this being an automatic process, nature or the plan of creation is telling us, no, now you do it. We gave you all the examples, all the metaphors. We showed you everything. We even gave, give you... We gave you enough desire to bring you here to the starting point. Now it's up to you. And how do you do it? Because it's a single system, because we were once part of this, the soul of Adam Rishon, as he said, this united soul, it's exactly pointing us in that direction. It's telling us, listen, you have to unite your desires with others' desires. This is a very um, neat way, really, of growing your desire. Because, like, uh, like, Rav's teacher, the rabbi, says, you know, where's the pharmacy where I can buy more desire to get into spiritual heart, mm. right? A again, it would have been very easy to just, oh, it's desire, you know, you know, here's the, let me pay you and get the desire. And then 
call it a day. No, the puzzle is a bit more um, intriguing than that. And that's why when we want to attract the surrounding light, when we want to uh, really r reach the, 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 you know, r the correct amount of the desire that will attract that light, the way to do it is by growing the desire with other people. So that's, um, you know, that's uh, something that we will get back to it. And as we said in the beginning, we have Toronto with us who is studying in a group. And people who are studying a group already have some sensation of it, how, your, you know, my desire is constantly affected by other people's desire around me. Um, I wonder if, if there's no questions from Toronto, maybe we can watch, uh, we can watch a clip about uh, drawing the light. And uh, so, Alex, are we ready with the clip, maybe? However, a person who starts studying, who wants to know, to feel, to understand, he comes with his will to receive. And he doesn't have all these discernments of lishma, lo lishma, for him, for others. He only knows what he knows, how the will to receive speaks within him, directing him. Rather, our entire work is to make actions that draw the light that reforms. That's the only thing I need to think about. How much do I give way to the light, room to influence me, to change me somewhat. That's what I should always be thinking about. What is my optimal state in terms of my connection with the group, the study, the intention, things I need to organize, all the details and conditions so that it's the best state for the light's influence over me. The light is constant, but I have to always turn myself in this direction, that direction, with actions, intentions, the books, the group, with myself, those close to me, far away from me, and so on. If a person always thinks about that and relies on this as his only hope because he knows and he understands that nothing but the light's influence can help him, then he quickly attains results. And then he expects the Creator's light. He feels how the, the values change within him towards love, bestowal, coming out of oneself towards the friends and the concept of the group, the internality of the group and so on. He sees his life there. He begins to see that there are two deficiencies in him. One is the natural one in which he keeps receiving and the second one is this new type of hunger and deficiency, a vacant space that develops in him and he wants to fulfill it but with this tendency towards connection. And then when he begins to feel these two deficiencies, it's certainly the light that reforms that the action of the light that reforms that the action of the light that reforms that does it to him. So these two voids already uh, are in in contrast and there's a direction and therefore he advances. But the main thing is only to direct himself to 
aim oneself towards the influence of the light that reforms in the best possible way, the most effective way. All right, welcome back. Uh, before we continue, we'll just say goodbye to our friends from Toronto. They're going to break off and have a local workshop, and uh, they're going to make local announcements about the upcoming Congress. We'll mention that uh, at the end of the lesson, so stay tuned. Goodbye, Toronto. Uh, I believe we had some more questions. We do have some questions. I want to mention one thing before we get to the questions. Um, it's the importance of questions, actually. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> because what we studied today, we, st we, we learned that most of what we're trying to do is we're trying to build this right desire. Uh, we're trying to yearn to, re to really aspire to this higher degree. And what this means is that we don't just forget about studying and intellectually and asking questions and all sorts of these things, just focusing on the desire. We need to find the right balance between both. In our, in our place where we're here in the fundamentals, we really need to still know the basics. We need to have the fundamentals down. We really need to have a certain grasp of, of this knowledge. This is, after all, the, the foundation of what we're doing. Um, so it's still important to, even intellectually, to understand at least everything that we're covering in the, in the fundamentals, to really have a grasp of it. And beyond that, to also remember that at the end of the day, regardless of the intellect, the most important thing is, is our aspiration. So with this in mind, we ask you to not forget to send in your questions and really just bombard us with as many questions as you, yeah. as you have uh, because this is also something very important. Well, also, this is our, our job. You know. <laughs> we, need to have, we need to have the questions to, to gauge you know, how, you know, how you, you know, where you are in the studies, if you understand, if you make sense of what, uh, what we're saying here, if it, if it lands anywhere inside you. And the questions is the way you know, we use to do it. So questions are important, and if you'll see, uh, if, you, if you ever had a chance to tune to our, you know, the morning lessons with uh, Rav Lightman, the live lessons uh, from Israel, you'll see that friends there have been studying 15 years, still have questions. So questions are an important part, because a question is a lack. It's a deficiency. It's a, it's a desire. So it, it serves to kind of point the desire. It shows where the desire is, is heading, the, the, the direction of it. So it's very important. And there were some, uh, uh, I wonder if uh, Alex, you can show the board. So we have, uh, I just want to do a little kind of recap. So we have some terminology. So or makif in Hebrew, or makif, or is light, makif, surrounding, surrounding light. That's the light that we attract with our desire. When we attract it, it works on us in a way called segula, uh, which is a remedy. And it's very similar to, if you will, it's like if, I'm trying to get a suntan, and the sun is here, right? So I need to arrange myself in different ways. I need to kind of turn left, right, uh, lie on my stomach, lie on my back in order to get the full effects of the sun. The sun stays constant. It doesn't change, and it surrounds me from you know, all the directions. I have to aim myself in the right direction in order for that, that sun to hit the areas that I want to tan. And in a very similar way, we have to uh, arrange ourselves in such a way that the surrounding light will act on our desire and will correct them, will we'll tan them, if you will. <laughs> you know, that's this spiritual suntan we're trying to get, mm. uh, to really show the light, this is what I need to correct, this is the desire, and, and please correct it. So it's a very similar process, only in the desire. Yeah, it really ties mm -hmm. to what we talked about earlier, following the advice of the Kabbalists. Because uh, the advice is really uh, what we is, is 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 them telling us which way we need to turn in order for the light to give us the maximum in influence. So it's connected to the two. And uh, <coughs> I have uh, I had a couple of questions from uh, Ken from Austin asking how this Kabbalist environment is different than any other get together, and I believe also. Also, uh, I saw it from Matthew from Vermont, also asking how to recognize authentic Kabbalah versus other Kabbalah centers or methods. So the answer again to those two questions is, is very similar. Um, you always have to ask, what is the goal? What is the goal in anything? And by the way, that's, I know a couple of lessons ago we gave, uh, we gave uh, some homework to, you know, to uh, keep a diary, a journal of some sorts, 
to see uh, how our actions are, uh, you know, are unfolding. And <clears throat> this is another good exercise which you can try to do between now and next lesson. Uh, just try to notice uh, how long you go through the day without actually thinking of the goal of what you're doing. Meaning, I run on autopilot. And why am I so comfortable running on autopilot? Because my program is designed to get me maximum fulfillment, pleasure, with minimum effort. That's how I'm built. So I can, you can be sure that whenever we do something without asking what is the goal, the goal is always selfish. It's pleasure, right? So when I get together with my friends, well, I want to get some pleasure. You know, I want to drink some beers, have some few laughs, I don't know, maybe uh, I, you know, I'm the kind of guy who likes to solve puzzles, uh, or maybe you like to gossip, or it doesn't matter what you like to do. It's giving you pleasure, which is why you're doing it. When we study Kabbalah, we have a different goal altogether. We're, we're trying to, you know, rise above this world, exit this limited, one-sided reality that we have, right? This egoistic perception that paints this reality, and we're trying to reach a higher reality. So, number one is the goal. What is the goal of that gathering? Now, once you have established that goal, you can ask, well, how do I know if I'm able to attain that goal in, you know, in this gathering versus other gatherings? And here, really, it's a question of, okay, are you drawing the light? Because we learned that there's no way, there's nothing in this world that, will, that is able to, to, to change that, that egoistic desire and my egoistic intentions. I'm built in this way, right? So there needs to be something that, that I can draw, that I can invite, I can bring in, that will help me change. So are we doing, in the, when we gather, are we performing actions, as Kabbalists prescribe, to draw the light that will work on us? Right? And we have, um, we have a few of these environments that are really most effective at drawing the light such as like um, Kabbalistic groups or getting together and really st studying together. There's something special about studying together as we learn that the upper system that we're trying to resemble is based on unity, it's based on connection, it's based on um, the, what, what Kabbalists call the soul of Adam Harishon being unified, being as one. So when we also come together to unite with others, to connect with others in these special Kabbalistic environments, these are the most optimal, optimal ways that we have to draw this, uh, this uh, surrounding light that, that will adapt us to this higher system. So we need to keep this in mind. And of course, there's plenty of opportunities to, to experience different things of this nature. We're going to talk a little, in, at, towards the end of the lesson, we're going to talk about this, uh, uh, what we call a convention or a congress where thousands or hundreds of people get together uh, in order to really to connect, to to experience this, am I giving it away? <laughs> <laughs> You're not giving it away, but I just wanted to say that it's exactly, I, I wanted to kind of preface that with a question from uh, Apollos from Peru, who's asking, so where do we find the surrounding light, or, or who does, who bestows the surrounding light as we seek to clarify our desires? And that's what, and I want to take this uh, to draw one of the, my favorite drawings in, you know, in, in Kabbalah. Uh, it's a great thing because, uh, and it will kind of, uh, it's not really answering Tina's question, but it will start to do it. Basically, the way it works is, it's very interesting. We have, you know, we are in a system, right? And in the system, there we are, individual, separate, seemingly separate points, right? Each one of us going about, you know, with our, with our little desires, each one is really stuck in its own little universe, so to speak, has a sensation of separateness. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry? Uh -huh. So, yeah, I'm told, I'm told that you probably can't see the top of my drawing, uh, so we'll try, to, we'll try to make it more uh, focused on the bottom half of the screen. So, what happens is, what is the kind of environment that we're trying to create? We're trying to create an environment whereby, whereby we're connecting those, we start to make those connections. We start to connect all these separate points that exist, right, separately in the system. As we make those connections, as we make the effort, as we study together, we gather, we come uh, together, you know, in a convention or uh, even during the studies, interesting thing happens. Our little desires start to unite. Basically, all our points in the heart, those spiritual 
desires that we have, they gather together and they start to attract the light which begins to fill the space between us. So you see, that's a, that's a very big thing. It means that we, sort of, we created a bigger magnet. So instead of this one guy trying to, you know, to attract the light with like a, you know, like a, little, a little thimble to you know, take some water from, from the ocean, suddenly we have a massive vessel. We have a, a container. We have something where we can already have a, some sensation, have discernment, have qualities, right? It's, it's something you can actually work with. Uh, so that's an important aspect when you start to consider uh, you know, the way we study the nature of gathering, uh, things like the convention that we will mention at the end of the lesson. So this is really um, something that comes to us from the structure of creation, which, again, we touched upon, and I know we'll touch again later in the course, uh, this soul of Adam HaRishon, which was shattered. So that shattering, as we, as we recall, if we can go back to the, to the illustration, the shattering means that these things, these connections, we stopped feeling them, okay? It's not, we're still connected. Nothing has changed from the perspective of the light or the thought of creation. But in our perception, we are not connected. We are broken, living individually in our little corners, right? That's what happened. But in fact, we are still very much part of this same soul called Adam HaRishon. We're not going to get into the numbers of it, the 600,000. Those are qualities, enough to say, just so it's not confusing. We're not talking about numbers of people on the planet. Rather, we're talking about a certain quality, a certain, certain intensity. Okay? Uh, it's like you can have a light flow, a certain intensity through many light bulbs, or in one big light bulb, it's the same amount of light. It's not, it's not broken into right, smaller pieces. It's, we measure it with, with you know, a certain wattage. Right? How many watts are we producing here? So it's very similar, those, those ideas. Um, and again, we'll get to it uh, later. We, you know, we don't want to confuse. We want to really kind of remain in, in the material. Um, so if there are no more questions on this, uh, maybe we should go to the kind yeah. of last. Yeah, let's, let's cover the last part. So okay. So um, we have many books, right? I mean, in our method and... In general, I mean, if you go to the library and you start looking for, you know, texts about spirituality, I'm saying even within the context of, of Kabbalah, of, of, of kind of just, just this part of the sandbox, so to speak, there are many books, right? And they're all written very differently, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I, can, I can open up a, a Bible and it sounds, you know, very biblical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's true, you know, and God said to Moses, and Moses, it's very dramatic. Like, you really want to make a movie out of it, right? And then you can open um, something, a different kind of book, uh, like the Mishnah, if you heard about it, uh, or the Talmud. And if you read that, it sounds like uh, an episode from uh, Law and Order, or, or right, uh, you know, it's, it's more like a TV, you know, a, a, a legal drama on TV. Right? Who did what to whom? Who owes money for the donkey who broke his leg in your field behind the fence you know, at night and all that? Um, so that's this kind of legal text, which, which again, the world has you know, taken very seriously and used and, uh, outside of the, the search for spirituality. Then you have this other kind of, of text, which is, uh, really sounds like fantastical kind of stories, right? With, symbols and signs, allegories, all those things. And, and finally, you have our books. I mean, the, the, the books that, that we have, the books that, uh, the kind of articles that Marcus read from the preface to the Wisdom of Kabbalah, which talk about parts of theme and sfirot and all those things. Very technical. Very technical very depictions technical. of the upper world. Right. So w are, th are those books, you know, different? Is there something better that we need to understand about it? So... Again, we don't need to get too technical. I'll write the name so we all see it. So the kind of the biblical language is the language of Torah. Torah. It's the Bible, right? It's that kind of language, as we said. The other one is uh, it's called the language of Halacha. Halacha is, is, is like law in Hebrew. It's like practical, like how how you walk about, right? How you walk through life in a way. So 
This is more kind of like a legal type of, uh, and it's this is the Talmud. Talmud Mishnah. Right. Talmud Mishnah. You can you can search those names on the internet um, freely. Then we have this Hagata. That's a language of allegory and symbol and symbols. Oh, legends. Right, legends. And finally, we have the language of Kabbalah. More Which is more like scientific. Scientific, almost. technical. I would even say even dry. It could be dry. So if you, if you don't get it, it's like trying to read, uh, you know, we're trying to, like you open a book, like a manual on electricity, for example. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, I don't, you know. Um, and again, we want to remember that these, these languages were developed also kind of in a way following the development of our desires, right? First, we have kind of the record of the Torah, which, which uh, the Torah, which really sums up kind of the entire period, uh, as we, if you recall, when we look through the history, the entire period from the, you know, Abrahamic, from, you know, Adam, the guy, not the soul, you know, but from Adam and, and Abraham and that whole period until Moses, you know, all that is summed up in the, in the Bible. Uh, in the five books of the Pentateuch and the other remaining books of the Old Testament, what we call the Bible. Uh, Halacha came a little later, and it's the, it's developed, it was developed mainly in the, uh, uh, during the exiles to Babylon, and, and when, when the Jews lived outside of Israel, the Kabbalists lived, uh, lived outside of Israel. And then there was the language of Haggadah, which developed uh, later uh, when the Jews were living in, um, already this is more the modern times, living in Europe, the Hasidism, uh, Baal Shem Tov. I'm throwing those names out. It's okay, you don't have to remember those. But I'm just trying to make a point that this was a process, just like our desires developed and just like we evolved. The same way the language we use to, uh, to write about our experience of the correction of spirituality, those evol evolve as well. And Kabbalah, that's really started all the way from pretty much from that time, the, you know, around the time of uh, you know the temple, and kind of developed all the way to today. That language basically is the language that's most suitable for us. Now, if you ask any of those books, if you can pick up any of those books, you will, any of those books, you can pick up a Bible, you can pick up a, a book of Talmud. You can pick up one of the you know, books of Haggadah from Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, if you've heard the name. Uh, you can use all those books for spiritual attainment. However, it will be very tricky. Why? Because uh, typically when we open up the Bible, typically when we start reading these things, we forget about that they're pointing to something higher. And we begin to see them only on this world. We see, you know, God said, let there be light. And we're thinking of light in this world and the way it's created and the earth and our world. And, and we're thinking of, you know, all these different people and all these things that are happening to them. We're thinking about this world. We're forgetting that all of these things are pointing us to the higher world. They're not talking at all about this world. And this is precisely why it's very difficult for us to use any of these other sources, like such as the Torah and the Talmud and the Mishnah, etc., it's very difficult for us. Even though they also have a great deal of reforming light within them, but because we don't, we're, it's very difficult for us to attune ourselves properly while reading these texts, they don't affect us the same way. So for us, in particular, it's better that, we, that we're focusing on the books of Kabbalah, which are dry, they're technical, they're talking about the upper world in such a way that it's, it's, you don't get lost in this fantasy that it's talking about something else besides spirituality. And in such a way, we begin to aspire for it, and it, 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 um, it, it allows us to receive more of this reforming light, more of the surrounding light that uh, gradually develops us and attunes us to this higher world. So for us, it's a lot better to use the books of Kabbalah, because the other sources are very difficult. We get lost in the imagery 
Um, they're very interesting. If you ever, you know, you yeah. read through the Bible, it's talking about this guy's fighting with him, this guy, you know, the dad, he slept with her, and it's like, wow, you know, it's like these are, you know, they used to have a lot more fun back then, huh? You know, it's, you're thinking of it literally, but it's uh, you're you're losing its its true purpose. You're losing the the remedy that's that's behind these texts. So for this reason, we're focusing uh, on the books of Kabbalah because for us, they're they're the best in helping us draw this reforming light. To, to help attune us to this higher state. Right. Because there's, there's less of a chance of us being distracted and kind of having our desire without even noticing going other directions. Because, again, for us, it's a, it's a fluid process. We, don't, we, we are unable, until we rise to, to the root, we will not be able to see really how our desires are working in us, how desires, new desires awaken in us and they immediately take us. You know, you can imagine a desire is, is, is like, a, like a vector. Basically, it's a force with a direction. Okay, I want this. So the minute that desire comes into, into my consciousness, and even before that, in fact, my whole being is already moving in that direction. I'm, I'm getting ready for that encounter, for, for getting that source of pleasure. And we, again, it's, it's a very... Uh, that force is very, it's very volatile, right? It's very, it's very easily swayed. It's, uh, uh, I mean, it, you can compare it to, for example, I remember when I was a kid and I went to an amusement park the first time, and you know, you want to be on all the rides, right, mm -hmm. all the time, uh, until at the end of the day, just, you know, if you just run from ride up one ride to another, you never end up on any ride, right? You're just running between the, you know, full of excitement. So it's very similar to that. We're constantly in this state of uh, stimulation. Our desires are constantly stimulated. So when you study Kabbalah, you really want to focus, you know, hone those desires just on that one direction, and that direction is towards that source where the light is coming from. So that the light is, you know, is working on you because that's how it works. Um, we have um, a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions. Let's see. I want to answer Apol Apollos from Peru, who's asking. Um, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Yes, actually, it, it is a pause, but it's a different question. Uh, he's asking, does it have to be, uh, when we connect, does it have to be connected to other seekers or anyone else, regardless they are seeking or not to, um, or, it's, or we don't want to attune their desires to the right one? I, I so think. Who are we connecting to? Who are we connecting to? Right. Well, the short answer is, you know, it's one system. We're connected to everyone. So, uh, you know, in... Technically, uh, we are connected to everyone, uh, or not, not technically, rather spiritually speaking, we are connected, and that is the goal of creation, to recreate that connection, uh, you know, for the purpose of attaining the full fulfillment that was prepared for us, etc. But uh, because we're unable to do this yet, our Kabbalists tell us, listen, connect with people who have the same goal, because you would not be able to connect with someone who doesn't have a goal to come out of his egoistic self. If you try to do that, all they, they would either look at you as crazy or they will continue to act in their natural egoistic way and you know, just continue to I don't know, <laughs> suck as much pleasure out of the situation. As we, as we all naturally do, it's fine. But if our goal is to really attract the light, we want to remember, we want to connect all those desires that are aimed at the light. Therefore, I need to find others who have similar desires and connect with them. So this is very important. And uh, again, I don't know if this is in this semester or the next, but you'll understand how the system is built and there's like the order of correction and, and how it's done. And uh, it's a little, uh, sorry, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, when you want to kind of ferment milk, right? So you start with a small culture and then that culture grows throughout the whole meal. But first you have to create that initial culture. And it's, it's very much the same. You know, the whole world needs to be corrected, connected. But we start with those who have a similar point in the heart. And uh, keep in mind that uh, what we learned today is that the entire work is building the right desire, building the right desire for spirituality. And if we, by ourselves, we just have, like Leo said, we just have a little tiny piece of that desire. When we begin to connect with others, uh, the desire multiplies. But if we're connecting to somebody who doesn't have this desire, 
then it's, we're not building that desire. We're not building that correct desire. If they don't have a desire for spirituality, which, what, what's going to happen as a result of this connection? So we really need to connect specifically with those who have a point in the heart, not just with those with a point in the heart, who are also on the same path, meaning they're also here who are studying with you in the education center or all over the world in our, in our system in, in B'nai Baruch who are studying with us. Um, and it's very important. Why is it important? It's because when we study, we, we begin to connect our desires. And if we don't have the same desire, where is the connection here? But if we do have the same desire, if we're both aspiring towards spirituality, we're here in the same path, with the strong points in the hearts, we're aspiring for this goal, then the, desi the desires begin to multiply. This is precisely why we have these big conventions that take place uh, once, twice a year. Uh, there's one that's going to take place in uh, New Jersey on July 24th, actually. If uh, <clears throat> This is something that's worth writing. July, oops, sorry, July 24 to the 26th uh, at the um, Sheraton, Sheraton uh, Parsippany. So this is a, a very practical way that we can come together and we can build the correct desire together. Uh, imagine for yourself, how many, five, six hundred, seven hundred people coming together, all aspiring for the same goal. Wow. Imagine what will happen to, <coughs> to your desire, that you're not, you're not uh, striving towards the goal with just your own desire, but now it's multiplied, and not even just by 500. It's, almost, it's multiplied exponentially by 500. Imagine the strength of the desire then that takes place at these types of conventions. These are precisely why we come together for, for such things in order to in order to build the, the right desire, in order to make it a million times easier to build this right desire. I, I mean, it, it's very easy if you just want to compare it to any sensation you've ever had. If you went to a, you know, a big baseball game, uh, a massive concert, right? Imagine for a second that sensation, all that energy, all that, right? Yes, it is all egoistic. It's all for the you know, very basic pleasure. But the quality of all those masses of people together in one place, right, cheering in the same direction, it's really un, undeniable. So imagine if you replace that desire for, you know, just animalistic pleasure with the desire for spirituality, and then multiply it by those, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, the effect, the effect is just unbelievable. Because here it's not just that we're all kind of rooting for the same team or listening to the same concert and there's a surge of energy, physical energy that I can feel and I can sense. Rather, there's a, there's a big cle, there's a vessel that can attract a huge amount of light that can work on us. And, and, and then this is already something that, that's, that's beginning to take us uh, away from, from the degree of this world towards the spiritual degree. So... I would definitely, it's, it, we're now about three months ahead. If you're flying from the West Coast or whatever, that was a good time to buy tickets. Um, again, each person, you know, make your own calculations, but um, this is really one of those big things that, that is, you know, it's worthwhile. It's like, you know, you know we save for our fishing trips and for little vacations in, you know, different places. This is a little investment in your spirituality. It's, it's, it's worthwhile just, just for the heck of it, you know, just for the experience. Come for something new. That's the idea. We have a few minutes remaining. Um, I wonder, uh, let's take two, you know, let's each take a question. What do you have? Well, there's a question from Sherry from Michigan who's uh, asking something along the lines of, what about contemporary authors? And uh, contemporary people who are writing about the wisdom of Kabbalah, um, do we use these books? Or are they also considered these, um, you know, the fourth, the fourth language that are using the, the writing of the Kabbalists? What about these people? Well, um, I'll sort of reiterate what we said in the very beginning. Um, in our world, the, it's very easy for us to kind of jump from flower to flower, and we think we're not missing a thing. Uh, and, you know, the digital culture hasn't made it, uh, you know, easier, but it, it is making it a bit more apparent. I mean, we're starting to see that, you know, we're not really 
multitasking, or rather where we have fragmented tasking, right? We're, we're, not, we're not doing more things better, we're doing fewer things better. So uh, it, it's, uh, or, or you could say you're doing more things but worse. So it, similarly, uh, what I would say is only you can tell when you've attained the first degree in spirituality, you can tell you know, which books are worthy and which are not, which authors are in attainment and which are not. Frankly, it's very confusing. The only advice we can give you is Kabbalists have made it very orderly. They have a lineage, a person in attainment teaches another person who reaches attainment, who then becomes a teacher for the next kind of group, the next generation, and there are books. Everything is much more sort of streamlined in that direction. So it's easier to kind of follow very practical advice and and check the you know check your progress and and really if you place yourself in that process fully then you'll be able to make a judgment call otherwise you'll never be able to see it you, we will always be confused because remember until we reach that first degree of spirituality we're judging everything from our egoistic vessels so I can I can't tell you you can go to a cartole and ask him but what can he tell you you have no way of knowing what he attained so we really have no way of, of checking any of those things unless we place ourselves into that environment, abiding by a certain set of rules, and checking our progress. There's just no other way to do it. And uh, while there's, there's a lot of uh, you know, great literature around the world, I think that if you decided to, you know, to kind of examine, investigate a path, you should examine it all the way. No, it's really just like hiking, right? You can't hike, you can't climb multiple mountains. Multiple trails. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, start with this one. And then yeah, I mean, if you want to reach the top of the mountain, you've got to climb the mountain, you know, on, on the trail. If you just keep changing trails, you're never going to rise up. You're going to keep kind of, you know, going around the base of the mountain. So, choose a trail and... With, with this in mind, we are sadly out of time. And we need to go to announcements. That's true. <laughs> So we have, uh, what is it, Spring 2015 Fundamentals. That's your us. Next, yes, your next lesson will be on Sunday, May 10th. If you're interested in meeting others who are studying Kabbalah, there will be a North American convention, as we said, New Jersey, July 24th to the 26th. Start making plans to attend now. The website and registration will be up soon. And we'll keep you posted as more information becomes available. Last, as always, please take any, un any unanswered questions to the forum where our instructors and moderators will answer them for you. That's it for today. Uh, we hope to see you uh, next Wednesday. Uh, we hope you're going to tune in Sunday for the next lesson, and we're going to see you next Wednesday. I'll be here with Vlad, and have a great evening. Goodbye. Bye, guys.